of new strings that would come about from you picking the VX anywhere from 1 all the way up to P. If you picked it 1, and I pumped it up once, then my new string would be 0 to the P squared plus 1. If you picked P, that's the biggest you could pick the V's and the X's, you could have them, you could have W be empty and the V and X together includes all the symbols, then the biggest it could be is 0 to the P squared, uh, pump it up once, plus an extra P. So if I pump it up once, my new string is going to be 1 bigger than this square at least, and at most, p bigger than this square. So it definitely can't be this square because it's bigger. And the next square is p squared plus 2p plus 1. That's p plus 1 squared. And it doesn't make it that high. This is actually the exact same idea that we did in regular sets. There's nothing different about the idea with a single 0 the v's and the x's just get bunched together because they don't make any distinction whether they were in one group or two groups. And the argument works the same as we did before. So it's true that I can win this and that square is numbers of zeros is not context free. And neither are primes and neither are anything that really takes any computation. You need a Turing machine to get all those things. So I think on one of the homeworks, we tried to do one of these um, 0 to, the comp to a composite number. Let's try to do this just very quickly. All right, you come up with that p again, and then you give it to me. And I need to come up with something which is um, longer than p and definitely a composite number. So I'll come up with uh, how about? 0 to the 2p. That's a composite number, and it's bigger than p symbols. You have to split this into five parts. And tell me what this middle part is. It's going to be between 1 and p symbols, somewhere in between. And then I have to pump this up and show you somehow that I definitely get a prime number, not a composite number. That's how I'm going to win, to show you that I don't get a composite number. Can I win this? What's a good UVX, VWX for you guys to pick? What if you pick the V and X together to just have two zeros in them? Say, make the V a zero and the X a zero. Then whatever I do to pump up these Vs and Xs, I'm getting multiples of 2 added to this string. And 2p plus any multiple of 2 is still going to be an even number, and it's composite. I'm never going to get a prime number. Now, maybe I should go back and pick a better string. But anything I pick here, 3p, 8p, you're just going to pick the v and x to be 8. I'm just going to be, in fact, you could pick it to be p. Right? If you pick it to be p, then I'm getting multiples of p added to some multiples of p, and I don't get anything either. Now I could do something weird. What if I did 2p plus 3? You know, then you can't do that trick on me, but how do you know that 2p plus 3 is even a composite number? It might not be. I've got to guarantee that that's a composite number. So if I do it by keeping this, you know, some multiple of p, then you can always win. So what does this say? This means you guys won, at least so far. I can't get a better string. And in fact, I don't think I can get a better string. I think you can always win. That means that 0 to the composite satisfies the pumping property. It doesn't mean necessarily that it's context free. It happens to satisfy the pumping property, but it turns out it's not context free. The only way to really show that this is not context free is to look at its complement, 0 to the prime. Here I can win. You can go through the details. I won't do it with you now. Here I can win. If you guys pick Vx, I can pump it up enough to get a composite number. I have enough control to win this one and show you that this is not context-free by the pumping lemma. And then since context-free languages, are they closed under complement? No, right? Too bad, huh? Wouldn't it be nice if they were? Then I could say that 0 to the composite is not context-free. So what do I do now? Maybe 0 to the composite is context-free. Maybe this is like the WW. Right? This is WW complement, and that's the WW. 
Sorry, that's a WW, and that's a WW complement. How do you know about zero to the composite? What is closed under complement? Regular. Regular sets are closed under complement, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Deterministic context-free languages are closed under complement. Mm -hmm. Can we use that to figure out that this is not context-free, we can use it to figure out that that's not deterministic context-free. Right? But that's about all we can do right now. So you have to be careful with these kind of closure properties to remember what's closed and what isn't, and to use the pumping lemma when you think it's going to work, but be aware that it doesn't always work. And it's not always the end-all of showing something is not context-free. When there's a single non-terminal on the left, it's called context-free because imagine when you're doing a, a derivation. A goes to B, C, A, and now I can do C goes to A, A. So B, A, A, A. This is a non-context-free derivation because it says you can substitute A, A for C, but only in the context if it appears after a B. Otherwise, you can't do it. So context-free means make any substitution you want. I don't care what context this non-terminal appears in in your sentential form. And these kind of things say you can make the substitutions, but only in the context of certain symbols around them. And this gives you tremendous power to make it feel like a machine. And this gives you less power. And the more general ones are called what? <laughs> the term context yeah. Um, there's a hierarchy in between. There's unrestricted grammars, which are the same as Turing machines. And in between them, there's a category called context-sensitive grammars. Things that have bigger symbols, more symbols on the left, are called context-sensitive grammars. But they have a particular constraint that still exists. And that is that the number of non-terminals here has to be at least as big as the number of non-terminals here. You can't have things do this in a context-sensitive grammar. In an unrestricted grammar, you can do this also. And context-sensitive grammars are not exactly the same as Turing machines. They're a subset. They're, they're, they're basically what you can do in, um, in order and space, algorithms that take order and space. But we're not distinguishing between those categories because it gets a little too abstract. So we're just thinking of regular grammars, context-free grammars, and unrestricted grammars. So after this, it's just anything you want from the point of view of this class. That's a good question. Um, other questions before we go on? Yeah, as long as you're yeah. de defining terms, what does LRK stand for? Hmm. Oh, that's a big question. Um, the L stands for left to right. And well, I guess the real answer is I don't know, but I'll tell you what it means. Uh, there's LLK and there's LRK. And they both parse from left to right, but this parse is top down and this parse is bottom up. So I'll say that the R stands for bottom up. <laughs> I don't remember what the actual abbreviations stand for, but this is a top down parser that goes left to right. This is a bottom-up parser that goes left to right. And the K means that they need to look at the next K symbols in order to be able to do their deterministic parsing. They both correspond to deterministic pushdown machines, but the K means that they're looking ahead a few symbols. Our normal deterministic pushdown machine doesn't look ahead symbols at all. It looks at the next symbol, decides what to do. Looking ahead means it can actually see a few symbols ahead to decide what to do to help it. So, well, now that you mentioned this, let me say a few more words because it, it will affect one of the problems in your homework at least. On your homework, I asked you to do this language, equal zeros and ones. Okay, not zero to the n, one to the n, but just an equal number of zeros and 